Warning, the following material is extremely disturbing. On Grave Matter, we try to be as accurate as possible and we collect information from many different sources. We don't condone or glorify murder and we try to be as sensitive as possible to victims and their families while approaching a serious subject matter with a sense of humor. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome back to episode 6. This is Jillian Gentry. And this is Chris Lang of The Grave Matter. Very nice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But yeah, this is episode 6. Um, I know we've dived, dove headfirst into I several serial... I think it's seri- Divin. Divin, we've Divin. Yeah. Um, headfirst into several serial killers. And it's been a hell of a journey so far. We've learned a whole bunch of stuff. As a matter of fact, today I learned about something that I've never heard about before. What was this thing that you guys were showing me? The body farm in San Marcos. Oh, yeah. I've never heard of that. And you showed me a picture of a fat, bloated person. You said it was a bad time to go because it's the middle of I, I, in summer in Texas. This I, All I saw was a picture of a decomposing body. In a cage. In a cage on the ground in the San cage Marcos. Is to keep the scavengers from getting it because they're outside they this is basically a research facility i guess um they quote unquote well they take people who have donated their bodies to science and they take them out there and they put them on the ground in in the shade in the sun certain times a year certain positions under certain conditions some of them are in cages it's like a study for decomposing bodies right it's how it's how the police determine time of death and what the fuck? This is a real thing? It's a real thing, yeah. Um, you and know so, how pissed I would be if I donated my body to science? And they're like, yeah, we're going to put you in a cage in the ground in San Marcos and watch how you uh, decompose. We've talked about it before, and we're like, all of it's good, except for I don't know if I want to be laying on the ground naked for a bunch of spectators to mm-hmm. come. You know what I mean? That's just... Disrespectful? Like, well, in some sort of... Depends on what you believe. I'm still going to go. Um, I, I'm, still, I'm still down to go and check this place out. Well, yeah. I mean, the students go out there, I guess, probably every day. Or, the students? Yeah. They, they study it. They study it so that they like can... Like medical students? Well, I would imagine probably like, or like elementary, forensic... like elementary students? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> students from the gifted music class? Right. Um, no. I, I imagine probably forensic pathologists and things like that go out there and they just... chart, you know, how, how the bloat and... Decom- decomposition and they determine so that when they find a body in these elements naturally mm-hmm. they can they can determine how long they've been there you know i mean it makes um, sense it's just i've never heard of it's i've never heard of anything like this especially right here you know i've grown up between austin and san antonio and this just is pretty surprising to me the picture was pretty graphic um yeah it's my bad um <laughs> i mean you i just thought you might want to know what you were uh, up against um, I'm down to check it out. But I mean, they leave them, they put some in cages so they can't be bothered by predators, but they also leave some in the open so that like you can tell what kind of predators, like armadillos or, or buzzards or ants Coyotes. or, you know, yeah. Yeah. What happens naturally if somebody is exposed to those predators after death? Is this just but, like a field in the middle of San Marcos? Like, I mean, well, I've never been, but that's sounds basically right. I've I mean, never even heard of it. I mean, that's just a research sounds facility crazy with, as shit. <laughs> yeah, and I believe they do tours and you know if that if that interests you, we'll I'm checking it out. Shoot us shoot us uh, some messages. Let us know if you guys would be interested in hearing about that cuz we'd love to go um, you know, do a little tour and and check it out and kind of go from there maybe plug our noses up or something if it's here in the middle of summer in Texas. It's all humid and 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 tonight it's been a terrible stormy stormy night and i um, surprised we still have power to be able to record this but um super creepy stuff yeah i mean i'm not opposed to going but i am opposed to going in june or august <laughs> or july join us in several months from now when it's cooler <laughs> i would not be surprised if i turn up sick on that that field trip day um i'll just have to go by myself or we'll take jimmy with us you guys remember jimmy woo from the first episode yeah, you, yeah. And, you and Jimmy go on ahead. Um, I'll be here at the house. <laughs> yeah. I'll support from far away. We'll take pictures and uh, maybe Jill can, on this day in history, on my this... co-host lost his fucking mind. <laughs> this day in history, I stayed home. <laughs> 
Oh no. man. So who are we talking about today? We got I got I got one guy and I think you got one guy. I think your guy's a lot more famous than my guy. Um Yeah, I tend to pick these uh you get the overachievers, good you know? Yeah, you get the good ones. And uh Well you, next time you get the good one because it's a lot of homework. Yeah. Uh, so. I mean, I feel like mine's not that crazy, so I'm actually going over a, a gentleman, a gentleman, what a, what a gentleman, by the way. His name is yeah. Kenneth McDuff, a.k.a. the Broomstick Killer. Uh, you may have heard of him, you may not have, but you're going to know by the end of tonight, that's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm here to learn. And what's your, what's, what's your guy, Tommy Lynn Sells? Tommy Lynn Sells. Yeah, I think you've probably heard that name before if you're into serial killers at all. But Yeah, let, he sucks pretty good. He's uh, He's not super nice. I've definitely heard of him, but I purposely did not do any research into uh, him because you I like to be surprised. I do, yeah, and I like it to be like a fresh, original conversation. But I'm going to go ahead and kick off mine if that's cool. Kenneth Allen McDuff, aka the Broomstick Killer, which is a super weird story. This isn't a normal story of a serial killer. What's so interesting about this is the way that the justice system failed over and over and over again, and put this guy back on the streets. And, we'll, and and it's it's pretty scary, honestly. I'm really glad that I didn't live in the town of Rosebud, Texas, which is creepy uh, by itself. This is kind of the Waco area, East Central Texas, and Falls County. Just a little overview of this dude. He was uh, he was born in uh, March of 1946 and eventually executed in uh, November of uh, 1998 in Huntsville, where many many of our uh, guest our guests wind up. I guess generally this dude he was a pretty pretty handsome looking dude. He had uh, five. I don't think I've ever seen him. I'm gonna look him up. Yeah, he's he's pretty handsome, <laughs> of course, Jill. Let me let me go ahead and Google him real quick. I'm gonna just put a picture mm-hmm. on my wall and uh, we'll just go from there. Now he had a. Uh, he had five uh, brothers and sisters. He was the the second youngest, fifth of sixth, uh, born to John and Addie McDuff. And the parents are a pretty interesting situation. Well, he's no Robert Ben Rhodes, but you know he's all right. <laughs> the fucking Popeye's grandpa. I'm telling you what. No, but he's he's he's, he's handsome suitable and, for the region. He's handsome and creepy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So his dad John was a successful uh, concrete man on a concrete business during the construction boom. Uh, back then, and his mom is the really interesting character, Addie McDuff, or Addie. It's either Addie or Addie. She was known as the Pistol Packin' Mama. Oh, God. And it wasn't a good thing. I think now it's a little bit more uh, acceptable, especially in Texas, to be, you know, having a concealed carry or anything like that. This chick was known as kind of a, a crazy woman that carried a gun on her at all times in her purse, and it was very strange for back then, you know? Um, she was extremely intimidating, and the story is that she uh, she one time pulled a gun on a school bus driver because uh, the school bus driver had kicked her one of her older sons off the bus. So that doesn't show a very good example for the the kids, I wouldn't think. You would right. <laughs> so yeah, she was a hot headed woman, and uh, there were some interviews and in, in some of the uh, documentaries that I watched of, of other people in the town that were like, yeah, she was not known as a good woman. And people generally avoided her. We don't um, kick it with that bitch. Yeah, and she was super protective of like everyone in the family, and so you know her her kids could do no wrong, type thing. Right? Those are always the ones that are the freaking craziest. Yeah, exactly. Think of like uh, Gemma from Son of Sons of Anarchy or whatever. Oh my you god, you know what I'm talking about? That's such a good show. I haven't seen Sons of Anarchy in two years. Maybe but think about how much of a lunatic she was. That's and, basically what this is, right? And she was, and it was mostly all in the name of family. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's exactly. She would, I mean, look what she did to Tara or whatever. You know what I mean? To Tara, I don't remember. In the kitchen. Spoiler alert. Spo- I, and so I haven't seen. I've only seen a few episodes. Well, then um, the spoiler would be harmful to you. So we'll carry on. <laughs> if you guys know what we're talking about, then you I know mean, what we're talking about. It's not like I didn't give you time to watch it. <laughs> no, that's fine. true. That's true. It's, it's been a minute. It but... has. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, I won't talk about Game of Thrones because half of you are going to stop listening. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, let's let's so let's talk about this dude, right? So this guy became a bully. Surprise, surprise, right? Makes sense. Uh, this dude became a bully in school from a young age, and he was. If you saw the picture, he was a pretty big, pretty strong dude, uh, but he was also very stupid. Yeah, I got that impression <laughs> based on the slack jaw look on his face in right. a bunch of those pictures. It's I mean, not it's... lying. It's the judge a book by its cover because <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you, this is this is exactly. I mean, he was a decent looking guy in his younger years, but mm-hmm. the older he got, the more he just kind of looked like a dumbass. Right, and I just, guy just that got darker and darker. You I just know? pictured him with no shirt on, holding a beer can, and standing in front of like a <laughs> like a 
like an old RV mm-hmm. or something, you know? Yeah, or, no, definitely. And uh, he's, a, he's a big dummy. And I remember this is one time in school where he tried to kind of assert his dominance. And he went up to this uh, this athletic dude, this like popular jock. And he was like, all right, let's fight. And the jock beat his ass. <laughs> and um, he was super embarrassed by it. And he actually wound up quitting school. Um, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. I'm going to whoop your ass. That will stop. <laughs> and imagine what that would do to you as a, as a young kid. You know, he was super embarrassed. He was super angry. And pretty strong, right? So it's just that one guy that was able to to beat yeah. him up. So he quit school. He he's he shot for the stars on that one. Yeah, no kidding. So it's 1964. He's 18 years old. I mean, he's obviously just an adult, and at this point, he's convicted of 12 counts of burglary and attempted burglary. That was like his first thing. Um, right out uh, of the gate. <laughs> well, immediately, yeah, the first 12, right? And uh, they did not take it easy on him. He was sentenced to 12. Four year prison terms. Now I'm not Holy shit. the brightest crayon in the tool shed. But that's like fifty years, right? So um Yeah, I mean it's almost like they were watching him for a long time and they're like, Yeah, mm-hmm. now he gets to be tried as an adult. Exactly. Look at you, dumbass. Exactly. And remember I said this is not a case of a normal serial killer, this is a case of the justice system failing over and over again. So at eighteen years old, he's sentenced to forty eight years in prison. Hmm. A year and a half later he's released. <laughs> Nineteen sixty five. Well that doesn't Mm. Mm-hmm. 1965, okay. um, he's released, and he. So when he was in prison, he was a, he was a good prisoner. He kept to himself, and they started experiencing overcrowding issues. So they let him go. Um, immediately after he gets released, he gets into a fight, and he goes back to prison, and then he's released like 30 days later. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a it's a hell of a start. They right? were like, put him under the jail, and then they're like. Oh, it's your birthday. Have well, a nice we go. All right, you we'll know. Get something nice to eat. Maybe his I, and I think honestly his mom played a, a, a lot of um She went down to the courthouse with her pistol. She was like, "Let my boy go." She bribed officials. Is what she did. Oh, over she bribed and him? over and over again. Yeah, because I took her for more of a threatening type and not a bribe. She type. was, but not to the judge or not, you know what I mean, not to the officials. So keep in mind that the father was a successful owned a successful concrete business, so they had a bit of money. Mm. Um and you know, so he wasn't robbing people because they were unfortunate and they couldn't afford. Absolutely not. He was doing it for the... For the thrill of it. For the thrill. Right. And so, uh, you know, a year later, it's the summer of 1966, he meets a guy named Roy Dale Green, who helps him do concrete jobs for his dad. Sounds like trouble to me. And they're drinking buddies. Yeah. Now, this guy was so ballsy. Not him, but not his friend, but him himself. They were so ballsy. He started bragging in the bars about he's like oh yeah man i've 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 raped these girls i've killed them and um you know at this point nobody knows that he's done this but he starts bragging about it and he constantly talks about death and murder and he's like yeah so i raped and killed these two girls it was absolutely amazing Mm -hmm. mcduff is saying this right and that's kind of like towards the beginning of summer of 1966 at the end of the summer on august 6th they decide to take a trip they're they're working for their dad all day for his dad all day they're pouring concrete him and his buddy and then they start driving up towards from wait from the Waco area up towards Fort Worth, and they wind up in this little town called Everman, Texas, south of Fort Worth. Uh, there's three kids there at a baseball field, and um, you know it's 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 nighttime, it's 10 p.m. There's there's three people. There is a uh, a guy named Robert Brand. He's 17 years old. His girlfriend Edna Sullivan's there, who's 16, and his little cousin Mark Dunman, who's 15, is there. And they're at their car uh, outside of the baseball field. So Green rolls up, uh, well, him, him and, his, and his friend Green roll up together, and Green doesn't really know what's going on. He tells him, I know some girls around here, let's go pick up a girl, and they actually did pick up a girl, they hung out with her for a few hours, dropped her off, and then rolled up on these kids. And so he's like, oh, these are just more friends, you know? Uh, Green was not the brightest guy in the world, so he, even even though McDuff was was talking about raping and killing, he never took it seriously, he never thought... You know, he's like, oh, this guy's interested in some weird stuff, but he never thought he was going to do it, you know? So he says, <laughs> right? Um, so they pull up on this car with the three kids sitting there, and, and they're, uh, at, the, at the time, McDuff is 20 years old, and Green is 18. The kids are 17, 16, and 15. Pulls up on him, immediately pulls a 38 revolver out and tells him to get in the trunk. Uh, you know, just, just like that. Uh, the kids listen. Ah, uh, there's one, one out of three chances that you can get the hell away before you get shot. I mean... yeah. I mean, it's not about how fast you are; it's how fast you are compared 
to the other people that <laughs> oh, you're man. with. <laughs> I'm I'm just saying I'm re- I'd rather get shot running away than be but taken it's his, somewhere. But it's his girlfriend you know? and his cousin. He's a, he's a 17 year old. He's obviously he's gonna protect his girlfriend. Oh, okay. He's gonna protect his little cousin, right? And they're thinking, all right, well they're gonna rob us. They're trying to steal our car. They had an old like 50s Ford. It was real nice. You know what I mean? So they're like, all right, they're gonna steal our car, or whatever. So he puts them in the trunk, and uh, McDuff hops in the driver's seat of their car, tells Green to follow him in his car. And they drive to a secluded field. So at this point, you know it's probably not going to go too well, right? They open the trunk. He says to the girl, to Sullivan, he goes, get the hell out. Pulls her out. He says to Green, the boys have seen too much. We got to take him out. And Green's like, "Uh, you know, I mean, should we let him go? I don't know. And he goes, no, absolutely not. We got to kill him. So the boys are on their knees in the trunk of the car. It's a big trunk, you know, 50s car or whatever, begging for their lives. And he doesn't care. He shoots them six times. Uh, he shoots He shoots one twice, he shoots another one twice, and then he shoots the other one again. Keep in mind, the girlfriend's alive the whole time, and she's now in the trunk of the other car. Um, oh, so yeah. she's listening to this go on. Yeah, and it's... it's go anywhere. There was, there was something that happened to the bodies to where he couldn't close the trunk after he shot them, so they wound up, he wound up backing it up against a fence, which is how they were, they were actually found the next day, and that's how they were found, uh, which is pretty crazy. So he tells Green to clean the fingerprints off the trunk, and they decide to drive somewhere else. They both repeatedly raped Sullivan after she had just watched uh, her boyfriend die and her boyfriend's cousin die. Um, wow, I mean, Green kind of like got real warmed up to the idea pretty quickly, didn't he? Considering, so yeah, he later said that it was under duress and that he was afraid for his own life. Um, if you're afraid, I don't think you're able to commit a crime like that. I agree, I agree. I don't think that if I was uh, fearing for my life, I could get a hard on and like do something like that. You know what I mean? Exactly. And my parents always told me when I was growing up, like if. Somebody comes up and puts a gun in your ribs when you're walking through the store or something or in a parking lot, and mm-hmm. they say, "Come with me, or I'm going to shoot you." Let their sh- let them shoot you in public where you can get help. Don't don't climb into their car and let them take you out in the middle of nowhere where they yeah. can keep you for days. And this is know? proof of that, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So they both repeatedly raped Sullivan, and then McDuff <laughs> says, "Give me something to choke her." So Green hands her hands him a belt, and he goes, "No, it's not good enough." So he goes in this trunk, the trunk of his car. There's an old broom. Do you knit you something? Right. So, well, this is where he gets the name. There's an old broom in the trunk of his car. He reaches it. He grabs the broom, snaps it over his leg, um, and then proceeds to choke her with it. And to the point where he's breaking her neck. I mean, he sat on her chest, pushed the broomstick over her throat, and choked the life out of her with it. That's awful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they had a uh, they had a pretty interesting plan. Afterwards, they dumped the body. They grabbed uh, some sodas from a gas station. And then they went to Green's house to crash out. Uh, the next morning, McDuff, he buries the gun next, uh, next to Green's garage. And then they go to their friend's house, Richard Boyd, to wash the car off. Now, this is, I mean, this was obviously late at night. So I guess they woke up later in the day. As they're at Boyd's house, the news comes on. And they had just found the two dead boys in the trunk of the car. Green starts feeling some type of way. He's super scared. And he's like, what have I done? What have I done? And he tells the friend's parents, Richard Boyd. Uh, after seeing the news, he goes, we did this. We killed this. We killed them. That was us. Straight up just admits to it. Uh, wow. The parents freak out, and they call uh, Green's parents. They call Green's mom, who then convinces him to turn himself in. Like, you Turn yourself in. You can snitch on this guy. You're probably going to get some type of deal. And he does it. Green becomes the main guy that testifies against McDuff. So this is the main crime right here. Mm-hmm. I mean, this isn't, you know, murders and murders and murders. This is it. Um Green testifies against McDuff, and he's found guilty in November of 1966. Only three months later, he's sentenced to death three times. Um, McDuff? Yeah. What do, Does Green get any kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Green got, um, I believe, 11 years he served uh, for the crime. So he, he did get uh, a, heck of a, a heck of a deal there. Um, well, so, considering he probably only served freaking nine months of it. I mean, that's how things get. No, he's, so I think it was like he got 25 years and he served 11. Okay, that's yeah. good. Mm-hmm. I mean... That's... But this dude gets death. McDuff immediately gets death. Now, the, the jails at the time are extremely overcrowded, right? Right. It's a real problem in Texas. I mean, he, always. And, and at this point, they had not executed anybody. I don't know if they had not executed anybody yet or if it had just been a long time. I think they hadn't executed anybody yet um, with lethal injection anyways. He wins two stays of execution in the next six years. Uh, delaying the process, obviously. And then in 1972, uh, the Supreme Court overturns the death penalty 
So he gets life. Temporarily. Right. right. So his sentence gets commuted to life, right? So he's doing life in prison or whatever. It's 1987. So this is, uh, what is that, 15 years? I'm not the best math guy. So <laughs> in 1987, uh, there's a ruling that the overcrowded Texas prisons violated the basic civil rights, and the courts set limits on the number of prisoners allowed to be in the facility. Uh, they come up with this back-end deal that they have to turn loose 150 inmates per day in order to relieve the overcrowding. So they start with, uh, this is with Governor Bill Clements and, and the Parole Board of Texas, right? So you go with violent murders, obviously, that's their first draft. So it was not. First they started with financial crimes, and then con, art- con artists, and then carjackers, and then burglars, and then murderers, and then death row inmates. It oh, went all the way fucking up. fucking small was this prison? So it was, it was the entirety of Texas, so... I mean, it was it was a lot of prisons. How about build another? Right, so well, that we get to that. It does eventually happen. There winds up uh, because of this, and it's really because of this one dude. Or maybe start killing the ones you said you're going to kill. That's a good start. Yeah, you I would mean, think so, right? I guess there's some red tape around uh, killing murderers. I don't know. Who would have thought? Um, we then go uh, 23 years into his sentence in October of 1989, which happens to be when I was born, uh, right? Hmm. Um. McDuff hires these lawyers over time that build a dossier showing the parole board uh, a bunch of evidence against Green, the other guy. The parole board is impressed, and they decide to release him. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So, (laughs) he is the first guy released from death row and put back on the streets. He returns to Rosebud, which, by the way, is a small town. Everybody knows who the broomstick killer and who the McDuff family is. Shit. People are fucking terrified. I mean, this dude's back on the streets. They know he's going to kill again. They know he's not better. You know what I mean? At this point, he's like 40-something years old. I'm sure everybody was seeing him everywhere, and they're like, oh, shit, Duffy's back. I saw this uh, this chart of like gun sales during the time in the area, and it's... Spiked. I mean, uh, bars were putting on the windows. The whole town is watching. How are broom sales doing? <laughs> Just one. You know what I mean? Um, so he's released in 89. And in the summer, and this is July of 1990, uh, there's an incident on Main Street in Rosebud. There's, uh, And keep in mind, in, in my mind, I was like, oh, he's still a dumb kid. No, he's 40-something years old. This dude pulls a knife on a group of black teenagers and starts yelling, yelling racist slurs at him. Um, and, and keep in mind, everyone's watching them. They're like, McDuff, that's him doing some stuff again. It's about to go down, right? Yeah. He winds up being arrested. It's a violation of parole. And once again, he's released in like 60 days. This is (laughs) unfucking real. Yeah. He's released in 60 days. Um, they should just give him a license and a body count. He's like some tags. I mean, seriously, it's like like James Bond licensed to kill, right? Yeah. Uh, as we go a little bit forward, um, Six months or so in January of 1991, he decides that he's going to turn his life around. This was based on an interview um, after he was back in prison. He briefly gets a job at a gas station making like four fifty an hour. And uh, he only lasts like a month. He quits. He disappears. And six months later again in the summer of 91, he's back on the cut in Waco. They call it the cut. It's kind of like the rough area, right? Mm. Uh, prostitutes, drugs, drugs, drugs. <laughs> um he starts doing all these drugs. He's got a probation officer who never sees him, never drug tests him, never checks on him. Um, and then we go to the fall of uh, 1991, October of 1991. Craziest shit happens. They start doing these random like DUI checkpoints. Mm. McDuff shows up, naked prostitute, passenger seat, handcuffed. And as they pull up on the roadblock, this chick is trying to kick the windshield out of the car. She's obviously about to die. And he runs the fucking roadblock and gets away. And they were like, was that McDuff? And they're like, nah. Was that a naked prostitute? Was that a naked prostitute that's about to die? Couldn't have been, guys. You must be tripping. You know what I mean? He runs the fucking roadblock and he gets away. And they never find him. Do they find her? Dead later. Wow. Yeah. It was the last time she was ever seen alive. That sucks for her. Mm-hmm. That was October that was like of 1991. A... So right after. I mean, how much. That's some luck there. That's like unbelievably good luck. We rolled up on a police roadblock. And then yeah. the shittiest he luck in it. the world that he still managed to get away with. He it. didn't even turn around. He plowed through them. And they're just like, well, oh, get some more roadblocks for the next car. <laughs> yeah. Like, what the fuck? Well. Let, that that maybe, one got away. <laughs> maybe send somebody after him. I don't know. You know, call nobody me got crazy. a glimpse at the freaking license plate. Like, right? They just knew, the they f- noticed what kind of car it was, but that's it. 
which does come into play a little bit later. But so we, we go to we go to December. It was right after Christmas on December 29th of 91. There's a dude named Alva Hank Worley, who's basically the next Dale Green who starts hanging out with them. They start circling this car wash. They're looking for a victim straight up. And uh, the lady's name is Colleen Reed. She's a 28 year old accountant and she's attacked at the car wash. She's kidnapped. Witnesses saw it nearby. They reported a tan Thunderbird, which was the same car that ran the roadblock, but they never they were never able to find it, you know, at least not immediately. So then we go to March of 1992. This is three months later. I, I know, it's crazy. It's like he can do whatever he wants, Can right? they find anything? I mean, nope. they couldn't find their own asses in the dark with a flashlight, it so, sounds like. Well, this is how it wound up happening. So uh, there's a chick named Melissa Northrop who was 22 years old who was taken from the gas station, the same one that he had worked at for that month. And he had bragged about it. He was like, oh, yeah, I know this chick that works at the gas station. We could rob it so easily. Da 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 da. Um, she's taken from the gas station in the middle of the night. They find, so she's missing and her car is missing. And then they find his tan Thunderbird like a block away, right? Which is super crazy. Finally, the cops are going, oh, okay, I guess it's McDuff, <laughs> right? There's his car. There's missing people. It's right next door. He's like the Elmer Fudd of criminals, and you're, they're, he's still out doing them. I just don't understand. It's absolutely embarrassing. Yeah. Totally embarrassing. Uh, so they find his car a block away, and now eventually he's, he's a prime suspect with direct evidence. <laughs> there are federal entities that want to get involved, specifically the U.S. Marshals, but they can't because there's no federal crimes. This is all in Texas, and the Marshals are going, you cops suck. Let us do it. You know what I mean? But they can't find a legal reason to get involved in the case until... They find a random informant that states he had been sold LSD by McDuff, making it a federal case. Wow. One sheet of acid is the reason that the, the marshals were able to get involved. Yeah, because multiple murders and, and all that wasn't enough. Welcome to, to America. Them. That's just insane. Right. So the marshals get involved at that point. They realize the cases are connected and they're able to track down uh, that friend, Alva Worley, and question him. Super shady dude. He uh, he lives in like a motel in the middle of nowhere and has all sorts of drugs going around. I mean, it's, it's obviously somebody that's connected to a shady lifestyle. He's a high school dropout, not the smartest guy in the world, and committed some petty bur burglary sometimes. Uh, he had really strange behavior in the interviews. And he winds up, the detectives roll up to question him one day because they're starting to question him like more and more often. And he opens the door of the detective's car, and he's like, hey, guys, I was at the car wash. Uh, I was there for the whole thing. And he, admit, he admits, yeah, it was, it was him. We, uh, we, we, we killed Colleen Reed together. He, he took the officers to the locations of uh, torture. He, uh, he kind of remembered all the, all the scenery, and um, even, to, even to the point where he remembered her screaming. He, he, he took them to the location of where it took place, and he put his hands over his ears and he was like, her screams are so loud. Like, it was still, he was still hearing them. You know what I mean? That's eerie. Yeah, super, super eerie. So at this point, they're, they're kind of looking for him. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'd, you'd think they'd start doing a little police work at this point, right? They're looking for him. Well, that's more than they've been doing, it, as far as I can tell. I mean... Right. And, and these prostitutes are starting to disappear from Waco. There's still bodies disappearing. So it's March of 1992, and the next person is uh, Valencia K. Joshua, who's a 22-year-old prostitute from Waco. Um, she was last seen looking for McDuff at a college campus, uh, Texas State Technical College. She was looking for him? Yeah, she was looking for him. Like, he, I don't know if he called her and was like, come find me or whatever. Like, she didn't know who he was. She was he was just a client. You know what I mean? Okay. He was enrolled in classes at Texas, Texas State Technical College. <laughs> right? <laughs> Murder know? man goes to school. Murder man goes to school. And that's where she was last seen. She's found later, but on April 26th of 1992, about a month later... They find Melissa Northridge's body, which causes a massive manhunt to go down because the marshals are involved at this point, and there's also a lot of media attention, which really starts picking up. Um, they aired on uh, May 1992. There was an America's Most Wanted. Remember that show, America's Most Wanted? Uh -huh. There was an episode about him, and uh, it went national. So McDuff at this point had completely disappeared. Nobody knew where he was. They had found his car. Never heard from him, Right. Right. Um, they wound up finding that prostitute's body near the school, like across the street from the school in a ditch. I mean, it was, he wasn't even trying at this point. Uh, well, but, he didn't need to. Yeah. He had a proven record of success. You know what I mean? Yeah. Dumb luck and dumb law enforcement <laughs> right. seemed to get him pretty far. Right. But they air that thing on America's Most Wanted and a guy calls in from Kansas City, Missouri and he goes, uh, hey, I, I work, I'm a, I'm a trash man. And that's my coworker. His name's Richard Fowler. And they're like, hey, no, it's fucking not Richard Fowler. That's Kenneth McDuff. 
Uh, sure enough, they find him, and on May 14th, or I'm sorry, May 4th of 1992, he's arrested, and he's flown back to Texas. Uh, it, it was him. He was tried for the murder of Melissa Northrup. Uh, so it was July of 1992. It was a rain. So where did they arrest him? Kansas City, Missouri. He so was, he went from wealthy in Texas and murdering a whole bunch of people and getting away with it, and went to man. go be a trash guy in Missouri to disappear. Because once they found his car, they knew he knew they were looking for him. So yeah, he went to Kansas City, Missouri, lived a different life, and then after they aired that, they found him. He was uh, arraigned in July of 1992 for capital murder charge. Pleads not guilty. And this is in Waco, by the way. They brought him back to Waco, and the whole town is like swarming the courthouse, spitting on him. So his lawyer requests a change of venue, and they and they take him. It takes about a, almost a year. In February of 93, they start a new trial in Houston. His 77-year-old mother is there and finally testifies against him on accident. <laughs> so she says, yeah, I allowed him to use my credit card. And they said, well, that's funny because your credit card was used right next to the murder at the same time. And so she wound up fucking her own son over on accident. Hmm. Yeah, which, I mean, it really worked in the in the DA's favor. Uh, I think it worked in everybody's favor. All his old friends started testifying against him. Worley testified against him, took the stand. He was found guilty, sentenced to death. So was he living Again. like a law-abiding life in Missouri? Like, like they don't Yes. Know, he didn't kill anybody while right. he was there? So he was in hiding. He was actually living a law-abiding life, being a trash man under a different name. Uh, he was found guilty. How hard was that, McDuff? I know, right? <laughs> he was he was sentenced to death, and then a year later they did another trial for Colleen Reed, and he was sentenced to death again. So at this point, you can he's tell been, him you're going to kill him as many times as you want to, but if you let him go, he's it been sentenced matter. to death five times at this point. Yeah, exactly. So um, this is the only man in the history of Texas to go from death row back home to death row again. They actually secretly brought him out of the cell to find Colleen Reed's body. And he did. Within he was he was within a they at the time they had a tractor and they were scraping the ground, digging up and he said uh, go a blade's length forward. And sure enough, they found the so body. He knew exactly. He, they said within 3 feet. They he was accurate of where the body was. Um he admitted to at least 8 killings and only one with a broomstick. Um, so I think I think there was uh, after after he started killing again, a couple more of those were with a broomstick as well. All right. He found what worked. You know what I mean? Yeah. He admitted to at least eight killings, and then on, on November seventeenth of nineteen ninety eight, he's led into the chamber at six p.m. Final words were, "I'm ready to be released. Release me." That's all he said. They've already done that a whole bunch of times. You just keep killing people. <laughs> <laughs> serious, serious. You've been released, brother. <laughs> he probably wasn't even talking about death. He just thought he was going home again. He's like, hey. It's time to release me. <laughs> it's time to. <laughs> Aren't you going to release I didn't me? Even think about that. No, they said he was extremely nervous when he walked into that chamber. Um, the uh, the witnesses were watching him, and they said when he walked into the chamber, the veins in his neck were throbbing. He was so scared of death, and that just satisfies me to some level. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Oh yeah. It was I fantastic. hope you were scared, and I hope it hurt like a bitch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he was shaking. Um, oh, the poor boy. Poor boy. What this led to, and I don't know, I've, I haven't heard about this until I looked it up, but it led to the McDuff Laws of the 1990s. They put $2 billion into expanded prisons. Tougher sentences, tougher paroles. You cannot be on death row and then go home, right? Um, <laughs> well, that's probably an improvement in, in, in its own right. So Right, yeah. So, it, I mean, it wound up being something that was a, a, big, a big learning process for the state of Texas, and it was just a super embarrassment. So this guy didn't kill a whole bunch of people, but the, the insane thing is, is that he was released 150 freaking times. You know what I mean? Um, he took a lot of years, though. Mm -hmm. And eventually uh, they put him to death. That's and how I, just, I always have to look at it. Mm -hmm. For every person he killed, how many years they had left, he took a lot of years. Yeah, he, he absolutely did. Even so no, at eight. And then it ended uh, just on a very, very quiet evening, November 17th of 1998, released me, and he was pronounced dead at 6.03 p.m. Mm, well. And we're about that. <laughs> yeah. So that's the story of Kenneth McDuff. Pretty straightforward. He's the uh, broomstick killer, and he was killed. <laughs> yeah. Just Eventually. A little, just a little light bedtime story for but you guys. Shit, I mean, he ran the roadblock. That shit fucking blows my mind. Did they not even chase him? You know what I mean? That's like, what I'm thinking. I mean... They recognized the car. Damn it, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> he got just... away. <laughs> well, well, fuck. <laughs> I told you to stand closer to that crack. <laughs> Get through that. <laughs> I know, right? Seriously. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, it's a very embarrassing story for the state of Texas, but I'm glad that they were able to make some changes, uh, expand the prison system, and stop people from like this being on the streets ever again. Yeah. I mean, until the new ones. I mean. <laughs> yeah, nothing's perfect. That's for damn sure. I think we all know that. Let's not pretend the justice system is anything No, <laughs> I mean. 
they're jailing people for way more minor offenses for way longer periods of time. That's for damn sure. Yeah. So there's I thought about that. Is this like a, was that just used as a, as a business move? You know what I mean? I don't know. There's some kinks that need to be worked out. I um, agree. Because I mean, there's probably people that spent more time in prison at that time for, or jail anyway, for minor vandalism or petty theft or, yep. you know, Mm-hmm. but keep in mind, they were releasing 150 people a day. And, um, as I was watching this, there were several detectives that said, keep in mind, there were hundreds of McDuff's that were released. It wasn't just this one dude. It was a big, big problem. You know Yeah, what I mean? it's curious how they how they decide who they're going to publicize, who they're going to, you know, focus on. Right. Well, because... he kept killing, obviously, and I think that was a that was a big part of it. I mean, I I look at serial killer information every single day. Mhm. And I'm still hearing about people that I've never heard about. Yeah. And I know a lot of them. You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I can vouch for that. Yeah, <laughs> That's for damn and sure. I still every day I come across somebody I've never heard of before, or crimes I've never heard of, and yeah. with you know high body counts. And well, good. That speaks to the longevity of our our show here. There you go. I mean, our plan is to work, half full. work our way out from Texas and eventually, yeah, spread across the country as far as our subject matter. But <laughs> on episode three hundred, we Jesus. dive into the mountains of Norway. Like <laughs> no, on episode three hundred, we finally make it to Amarillo. I mean, there's just so. Damn many of them. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Every time, you know, and I'm not picking these subjects based on the fact that they're from Houston or or El Paso, but golly days, there's a lot of them from that area, you yeah. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And I had no idea he was from that area. Yep. So, I'm just going to stay away from El Paso and... In that, Houston. Yeah. Yeah, he was, I mean, so... This is more of like he was in the in the Waco area, but he traveled around a lot. You know what I mean? So he uh, he was all over the place. Yeah. Wow. So that's the story of our uh, broomstick killer. But let's go ahead and dive into your into your guy right here. I have got about twenty minutes left or something like that. So uh, we'll see what we can get to. You know what I mean? Yeah. This guy was. Um, he was. What was, he was Mr. Uh, Smells? Tommy Lynn Smells? Sells? Sells. He's oh, just a dick. And like you, you met, you met, you talked to somebody that worked with him. Yeah, I did. This is the carnival dude. Yep. Oh shit! You guys need to hear this. Okay, so basically, every day on our Facebook page and our Instagram, I do a on this day crime or serial killer event. Yeah, whether it be yeah. like a execution or this day in history. Yeah, it's pretty sick. You guys got to check it out. Was it Osama bin Laden's death was yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, badass. So anyway, I posted about Tommy Lynn Sells last month at some point, and under the post, somebody commented that they actually knew him, and so obviously like, you didn't you didn't ask you just randomly said it. Yeah, he just said I I knew that guy, and <laughs> Holy shit. I was like, can I inbox you? And he's like, yeah, sure. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I um I asked him if he would you know just give me some information about what it was like to know him, what his mannerisms were like. What Fuck his, yeah. You know, just anything he'd give us. I was like, you you know, even if you didn't know him well, just what was your impression of him? And, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. What do you, what do you say? He said, I'm just going to quote it okay. um, so that this is his own words. He said, yeah, I was only 15 at the time. My older brothers and I always worked for the Heart of America Carnival when they came to town. It was also a good opportunity to sell marijuana to the carnies. <laughs> I remember after work, a group of them buying pot from us. One of them kept asking if we could hook them up with heroin. That was Tommy. I remember because of those eyes. I didn't even know of him until his execution. I bought a copy of Through the Window by Diane Fanning. That's why I read about him being in South Texas and working for the Heart of America. He was a good worker. He was polite and quiet, but not too quiet. He didn't really use profanity. I remember him having a strange way of staring at you with those pale eyes. They made you wonder what he was thinking. Other than that, there were no real red flags. All of the carnival folk were weird characters. And that was it. I'll give them that, yeah. That does sound pretty weird, but when you, I guess you put it into context of where they were working and the drugs they were on and who they were around, you know, I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think my mom interviewed some carny folks once for a for an article. and, and Yeah. The only thing I really remember about it was that was a girl named the girl's name was Pickle. That was her name. It was her and her boyfriend, and it was it was a really interesting story. But I mean, it's all kinds of people. It's just transient, you know, workers and people who don't have a place. And you know, I feel like yeah. we're gonna say transient workers so many times throughout this podcast. <laughs> yeah, probably a lot. Yeah. I mean, 
who's better to murder people than drifters? But God, that is creepy, though. That is such an interesting thing, just to find someone that worked with them and just to get that little insight into that person's mind. And yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Even if he didn't have a lot of information, I just thought that was pretty cool that oh, it's yeah. information nobody has yet. You know, yeah, unless no, they knew badass. him. That's a know? primary source, goddammit. <laughs> and I actually came across some information during this research mm-hmm. where it lined up with with his statement about him, like him looking for heroin. And like, like you found out that he was a heroin addict. Right. And, yeah, and yeah. that he worked for the carnival, you know what I mean? Things like that. Just, yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, that's what he was talking like that's about. That's definitely true. Yeah. So this guy, Tommy Lynn he was, um, he was suspected, suspected of up to 70 killings. Of 70? 70. That um, is a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, the n- numbers are always going to be, if he like it goes back and forth, but mine killed like what six, seven, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> or eight. He said he admitted to eight. So well, this guy's downfall really was well. I mean, not his downfall, but his his bring down, I guess, mm-hmm. was for two specific murders that I'll get to. Wow. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, so I'll start out a little bit with his uh, his early life. Um, okay. He was he was born in June of sixty four, June twenty eighth. Um, he had a twin sister, actually, which I don't know why that shocked me so much. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think it's because the psychology of twins, you know what I mean? Like, they're always similar. In tune with each other. Yeah, It yeah. makes you wonder what she would have been like or if he, you know. Because she died, right? She died, yes. Yeah. Uh, they both contracted spinal meningitis. Um, Jesus Christ. I tell you what. Meningitis and serial killers. We're going to be onto some shit here, guys. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a pretty blatant you know pattern here yeah so um, far <laughs> yeah they contracted it when they were 18 months old i believe um, oh wow yeah he survived he they both had it he survived she did not so that's a rough start right there from the beginning he's not even you know t- two years old yet and yeah his twin sister tragedy died. strikes and that's why i wonder you know because they say that twins have like this telepathy between each other and they have their own language and you know is that part of why he turned out the way he did is because he lost his twin so early or yeah you know or was that just who he was or you know what role did that back play? to that nature versus nurture thing mm-hmm. um so after that um tommy's mother sent him to live with his aunt bonnie um okay and she had three other children. But just sent him? Just sent him. Like you remind me of the other one? Maybe. I don't know. Um, she didn't seem like she was a real winner of a person anyway. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I mean, maybe she saw something in him that she didn't like from be- the beginning. You know. God, that brings up so many questions. Why him? Yeah. You know? Well, when he was five years old, um, his mother insisted on having him back because she found out that <laughs> Bonnie, his aunt wanted to adopt him like wanted to formally adopt him and for some reason she yeah, was like she's raising him yeah she was like nope he's coming home right now so he went home to his mother okay that's some red flags already first of all this kid's sister's gone he's obviously going to have abandonment issues if the other kids are still in the household yeah. now he's used to a new mother basically and is pulled away from that situation back to his obviously crazy mother for no good damn reason yeah. like what's the point like she let him stay there for five years or you know three mm-hmm. years and then she was just like wait you want to actually you know have I mean, responsibility for him for his life i don't think we're experts but we're both parents and i think that would fuck a kid up i mean yeah. call me crazy you know yeah i think so so he was five years old he was returned to his mother um so when he was eight years old, he began spending a lot of time with a man named Willis Clark, who began to molest him with the consent of his mother. What the fuck? Yep. Um, he, he later stated that the abuse greatly affected him, which is pretty obvious. I think it does yeah. anybody who goes yeah. through that. Uh-huh. And he, he, he uh, quoted that he would often relive his experiences through his crimes. Wow. So like he would, I guess, have flashbacks of this as he was committing his crimes. Wow. Yeah, so... This is a bad situation all around. Right. You can tell this is not going to turn out well. No, no, it didn't. Um, (laughs) It did not. (laughs) Not for anybody involved. Yeah. So basically, by the age of seven years old, um, it says that he was already drinking heavily, smoking weed. Um, He was molested around eight years old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And he dropped out of school at ten years old. 
<laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, he was on the path to righteousness. Yeah, no kidding. Success. So basically what happened, so his mother forced him to come home, and then he was molested with her consent and her knowledge. And then he obviously started acting out. He was drinking, skipping school. Then he quit school at 10. (laughs) Okay, so at the age of 13, he fucked up real good. He went into his grandmother's room and stripped down naked and got into bed with her. And With his grandma? With his grandma. And his mom was like, all right, well, that's that's enough for me. I'm good. So she, like, snatched her the three kids, the, the great mother that she is, packed all her shit, and left. What about the other kids? Were the other kids molested or anything? Was it just this kid? Probably just this kid. I mean, I don't really, I didn't really find any information on the other kids at all. Yeah, um, they're probably trying to distance. They're not them. famous murderers. <laughs> well, I'm sure they distanced themselves pretty well after. Yeah. Um, so after the whole naked grandma incident, his family abandoned him. They just packed their shit and said, "Good luck." I mean, he's 13. So yeah. yeah. They didn't give him a forwarding address. They didn't tell them where the fuck they were going. I mean, so they left. They skedaddled. They got wow. The f- so they kicked him out of the house, and then they left the house. No, they, I don't even think they kicked him out. I think they just hauled ass. They just he woke up one morning and was like, "Where's breakfast?" And he's like, "Where's people?" Like it was like Holy a Kevin McAllister shit. shit all Jesus over again. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean he, they just vanished like a fart in the wind. They I were. Mean, I- <laughs> They just took off. I feel fucking bad for the kid, man. They just are you in an OFT? Oh man. Yeah. So um, they abandoned him at thirteen, and he immediately. It's like he, based on what I read, he noticed everybody was gone and was like, "All right," and he took off. He like just walked, and. Pretty, I mean, what would you do? I don't know. Not get naked with grandma to begin with. <laughs> it seems like a solid choice. Yeah. So. So he took off walking, and that, it was shortly after that he claimed he committed his first crime, and he violently pistol whipped a girl, um, wow, till she was unconscious. Didn't kill her, but tried or got close. Yeah, um, he drifted from town to town. To, to, <laughs> so we're gonna stop that and get rid of all that shit. I'm gonna keep it in there. No, he drifted from town to town stealing. Um, he claimed to murder the. F- have his first murder at the age of 16. He murdered a man after catching him molesting a boy. Um, Okay. This is unsubstantiated claim. Okay, so it might have just been his reason, quote unquote. He might have been in a flashback. Yeah, I mean, well, it could have been for notoriety or whatever. I mean, by the time he was confessing to all the shit, he he was a done done duck, you know what I mean? I mean, what do you think? um, Hard to tell. Well, he didn't give any specific information as far as I could find. He didn't have a name or where this happened. He just said, oh, I caught the first guy I killed. I was 16 years old. It sounded like a... It sounded like a... little hyped up story. Yeah, like, Mm. don't fuck with me. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) He's in prison trying to prove a point. You know what I mean? Right, I killed my first motherfucker. Yeah, okay. I was 16 years old. Um, But it's interesting that he put the reasoning in there was he caught him molesting a, a, a little boy. You know, specifically. Yeah. So he did provide a name for his next crime that he says he committed. And it's so hard to sort through these. I mean, they said he he's, could be responsible for up to 70. Yeah. And then they gave examples of like 25. And then they're like, we don't know which ones are true. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, So he claimed to have shot and killed John Cade Sr. on July, uh, in July of 1979 uh, while robbing his home. He said he was, he was walked in, he walked in on a robbery. And so he killed him. Um, oh wow! He said, uh, "That's kind of like Angel Resendez. He had some supposedly some similar mo's. Like his primary motivation was robbery, and then if somebody happened to walk in or wake up, then he would kill him. And if they were attractive, then he would rape him as a tertiary motivator." Yeah. So he says that in May of '81, he found his family. Like they were living in a different state. I don't remember what state now, but he found them. He fucking found them. And I can just imagine his family's reaction when he comes to the door and he's like, "Hey, I'm back." You know, it's me, Tommy, shit. and so uh, he's he moved back in. He moved back in. They, yeah, for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't long after that that he was kicked back out because he went into the bathroom when his mother was taking a shower and tried to force her to have sex with him. That'll do it. And she was like, "All right, so this isn't gonna work. This arrangement." Um, Once again. <laughs> I know we just talked about what your portion of the bills are going to be and your responsibilities <laughs> and like what shelf is yours in the refrigerator, but you know. Jesus. So they got rid of him again. 
Um, and I feel like maybe every time they every time they encountered him, they fucking picked up and moved away. You yeah, know? Yeah. And they were like, God, if he finds us again this time, you know what I mean? I mean, seriously, they just abandoned him his whole life. I mean, he's an abandonable guy. If you want to be truthful about it. No, I know. I just feel some type of sympathy for like. The he's first... literally tried to bone every adult female. In yeah, his no, family. but I mean, I well, right. So that's an issue, obviously. But I mean, from the fact that he was abandoned it as a baby, damn near. You know what I mean? And then, yeah, I feel like I understand why this kid turned out so fucked up. You know? Yeah, I mean, well, he didn't get any less fucked up. <laughs> yeah, he, uh... he got a lot worse, huh? Yeah, I feel like they should have just had like a chart on the refrigerator. It's like uh, Tuesdays you sweep. Um, you know, Thursdays, you got to make sure the trash can's at the end of the road. Mm-hmm. Feed the cat. Don't try to engage in sexual activity with your female f- maternal family members. Right. You know, on any of those days. Basic stuff. That's that's a, that's a Monday <laughs> through Sunday one. Yeah. So, uh, no holidays off. So, basically, after that, after they kicked him out again, uh, he traveled by train and he worked as a carny. But in May of 84, he spent 11 months in jail for car theft. Hmm. He was sentenced to two years, but after the, that 11 months, they released him. Um, and after he was released, he went to, um, in July of 85, he was 21 years old, and he went to Forsyth, Missouri, um, mm-hmm. and he worked at a carnival there. While he was working the carnival, he met 28-year-old Ina Cord. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So um, he met Ina and her four-year-old son, Rory. Oh, shit. Yeah. Court invited Cells to her home that evening. According to him, um, they had sex. She He fell asleep, and when he woke up, she was going through his bags, like, stealing his shit. Huh. Um, so his answer to that was to beat her to death with her son's baseball bat. And then he murdered her son because he had seen him. He knew who, that he'd come home with him. He, Jesus. He murdered him because he was a potential witness. Wow. Yeah. A four-year-old? Uh, a four-year-old. Yeah, I got a four-year-old son, so fuck that. Yeah, um, and mine's three, so yeah. still fuck that. And yours is as big as mine, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big one. Um, so he murdered the he murdered both of them, and their bodies were found three days later. But he'd already left town. Wow. Yeah. So in September of 84... And she probably wasn't even going through his shit, in my opinion. No, I mean, and even if she was... Take your shit and leave. It's her house. Like, <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, that's, it's not like she broke into his house. You know right, what I mean? Right, right. Like, There's no reason. To, yeah, of course. Talk about overreaction. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so September of 84 to May of 86, he was locked up again for drinking and driving. Uh, he crashed his car. So still not known that he had committed these. Right. Yeah. He, um, he, he spent, he spent some time in jail from, what is that, about two years? No, a little bit less than two years. Yeah, a little less. After that, um, it's basically just a, you know, like a list of, of of crimes that he admitted to while he was being questioned in jail. And he said he, he shot a man in St. Louis. Uh, it was a stranger. He said it was self-defense. <laughs> he uh, always has a reason, huh? Yeah, I mean. Noticing a trend here. His reason is that he's batshit crazy. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Messed up, but. Mm-hmm. Um, after after that stranger killing in St. Louis, he went to Aransas Pass, Texas. All right. Um, while in Aransas Pass, he overdosed on heroin. And after he was released from the hospital, he stole a car and drove to Fremont, California. Jesus Christ. And in, in, in Fremont, he killed uh, Jennifer Dewey. She was 20 years old. He shot her. And he killed Michelle Xavier. She was 19 years old. And he cut her throat. Self-defense. Obviously. Yeah. And she was going through shit. So what is, he, what is he to do? <laughs> right. Now, this is unconfirmed, but in October of 87, it says uh, that he admitted to drugging a 20-year-old woman named Stephanie Stroh. Hmm. Um, and when she was in this drug-induced state, he strangled her to death. Um, wow. He claims that he drove her to the desert and disposed of her body in a hot spring um, by, like, tying concrete around her feet and dropping her in. Wow. Um, they don't have any proof of that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then he also claims to have killed Suzanne Cor- Corks. She was 27 years old in New York City. It didn't say what her... Um, Man, this guy's all over the country. Yeah. They called him Coast to Coast. That was his his uh, moniker or whatever. Yeah. So, it didn't say how she was killed. It just says her age in New York. So, now this is, this is a gnarly one. Um, all right. 
So strap a seatbelt on. He admitted there's actually these next ones are pretty bad. Okay. Um, he admitted to killing a 10 year old kid named Joel Kilpatrick. And basically he said that Joel and his mother had run into him at a convenience store or something. And his mother was rude to him. Uh, yeah. So once he, again, yeah, got a reason. So he followed them home and he broke in and killed the kid. Um, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, and the mother got charged with the crime and she was arrested for it. And no shit. she served time for it. But based on his testimony after he got rest- arrested and he told he was admitting to all these crimes, based on his testimony, she was acquitted after 12 years. 12 years? Oh, man. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Can you imagine losing your kid and then being charged with it and then having everyone think that you had something to do with it? Yeah. And then finally, you know, um, as bad juju yeah no kidding so on the evening of november 18th 1987 um police went to the mobile home of russell keith dardine uh he was 29 years old um they lived in ina illinois (laughs) all right um he failed to show up for work that day and so somebody came to investigate where he was right when they when people arrived there they found the bodies of his wife and son they were both brutally beaten Um, I think, I believe the son was beaten to death with a hammer. Jesus Christ, man. It's always like the mom and the kid. Yeah. And I think the mom was, I think she was beaten to death with, um, a baseball bat. Um, Hmm. again, so Ruby Elaine Dardine, 30, she was actually pregnant with the couple's daughter. Um, she was beaten. This is really tough. This one's bad. She was beaten so badly that she'd actually gone into labor with the baby. And according to him... He beat her to death and then beat the newborn baby to death. A little girl. Wow. Um, That's probably the toughest one I've heard so far. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So before 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 the killing, he actually attempted to, to rape Elaine Dardine. Uh-huh. So he put the bat, after he bludgeoned them to death, he, he actually stuck it in her. Wow. Um, and then he put, he put the, her and her son in the bed together and covered them up. With a blanket. Um, terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. Yeah. So um, that one went unsolved for 12 years. Jesus. Yeah. Um, until he admitted to it. Now, the family of the the Darting family that are left, they they have some trouble believing his story for some reason. They doubt it. They doubt it. Hmm. Um, so basically... They thought that Keith, the husband, was the prime suspect, but that theory was discredited the, discredited the next day because they found his body in a field nearby. Oh, shit. Yeah, he'd been shot, and his genitals were mutilated. His car was found parked near the police station in Benton, and the examination showed that he had died within an hour of his family. So yeah. they probably he probably killed him and then went to his house. So nobody was ever charged with a crime for that it was based on his own admittance but basically in order to charge him for that crime he would have to go to where illinois i guess oh yeah so yeah. he could aid in his own defense and he mm-hmm. could help with the investigation um but texas forbids death row inmates to leave the state okay for any reason so interesting yeah this guy was truly all over the place um so this one's uh pretty close to, close to home um on April 18th of 1999, Sells was in San Antonio looking for work. Ooh. Yeah. Um, he was he was trying to get work with the carnival that accompanies the fiesta. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, celebration, which I think was last week. Yeah, we've all been there. I've never been there, but... Um, well, I lived in San Antonio for 10 years, so... Yeah. Definitely. Um, That's well, creepy, though. I've been so close to that so many times. At, yeah, my nieces were at fiesta last week. They lived there, so... Uh, which this is a hard story for me because the the victims the same, close to the same age as my niece, and they look really super similar. To oh each other. wow! So uh, I did this. Uh, this is the one I did on this day because Fiesta was last week. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the murder of uh, Mary B. Perez, B. E. A. Oh uh, okay. She was nine years old. She was at Market Square with her family, and they were celebrating Fiesta, mm-hmm. um, and she disappeared. Wow, that's like the heart of it too. Yeah. Is oh, it 1999? Yeah. Wow. April of 1999. Her body wasn't discovered until over a week later. It was found along Alizan Creek. The medical examiner said that she was like really badly decomposed, but he believes that she was strangled to death. Mm. So basically, his story is that 
that night that he was there looking for work, him and another Carnival employee identified in police documents only as red was found. They, they found Mary B crying saying she couldn't find her family. Hmm. Um, cells told investigators that he and red were drunk and on drugs. They walked with Mary B to a spot near the Creek behind the union stockyards. It's about a mile and a half from market square, I guess. Yeah. Um, they found a blue mattress that was lying there that somebody just disposed of. And, uh, cells claims that he passed out on it. And then he says he woke up and saw red having sex with Mary B, which I believe they mean raping her. Mm -hmm. Um, I hate when they say that. Yeah. Yeah. I hate when they call it, try and fluff it up or something. Yeah. Um, she's a nine year old child. So, so anyway, he said that he woke up to him raping her and, um, he said he passed out again. And when he woke up that red was molesting him. This guy's full of shit, man. It was like forcing oral sex on him while he was unconscious. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Like who? Yeah, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, so with his track record, I mean, you don't believe anything this guy's saying. No. I mean, Um, he said that they both fought each other, and Red ran off. Convenient. So, um, he said he noticed he noticed Mary sitting on the ground. Um, He said she was sitting on the ground, holding her knees to her chest. He walked up behind her and strangled her with his hands. He claimed that he killed her so that she couldn't report him. There's no proof that Red even exists. Uh, he was eventually sentenced to a life sentence for that murder. Um, Sells? Yeah, Sells yeah, yeah. was. So he's he's claiming that he had a co-conspirator that actually did the, the bad it's shit. Like, it's like he's always trying to paint himself as a victim of some sort. You know what I mean? Right. Mm-hmm. And he might have been able to pull that off as a kid when he was, yeah. but, you know, it's... Too far terrible. gone at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's not the last of it. Like I said, there's an entire list of shit that he may or may not have done. Right. But this is the crime that got him death sentence. Okay. Um, All right. So he was already in prison, though. He had already got life for one, and then he got charged with something else? He was in He was in prison for this one I'm about to talk about, and okay. then he confessed to the Mary B one, and they gave him life. I don't... Okay. That doesn't make any sense to me at all, considering they've given him death. Well, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's My just, guy got death and then was released. So, well, yeah, I, I mean, guess it could know? be worse. Yeah. Um, so basically, he broke into the home of, uh, there's a couple that he had known. He was new to town and um, he met this couple. And they were, you know, they were not friends, but they were acquaintances, getting to know each other or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, basically, their 13-year-old daughter caught his eye. Um, oh, shit. Yeah, Kayleen... Katie Harris was her, her name was Katie her, her nickname. Um, she was 13 years old and she had um, a 10 year old friend, Crystal Searles staying with her that night, spending the night. Mm. Um, they were attacked in Harris's bedroom. That's terrifying. Just yeah. knowing, cause I know what's about to happen. You know what I mean? Right. Well, um, basically Katie and Crystal stayed up late and they slept in the same room. Crystal, she woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of somebody screaming. She was on the top top bunk of the bunk beds that they were sleeping on, and uh, she looked over the edge because that's where the sound had come from. She leaned over and looked around, and at the end of the bed was a man she had never seen before. And that and that was Tommy at the end of the bed. Yeah, he had come in through a window, and he attacked Katie Harris on the bottom bunk. The thirteen year old, right? And I'm not okay. sure that he even realized that um, the other one was there. That Crystal was on the top bunk. Yeah, but he cut her. He cut her throat. Wow, Katie. So he turned to leave to go out of the room, and when he went to close the door, he noticed her up there. Oh shit! And so he came, he came back in, and she tried to like dodge him, and he jabbed her in the throat. Um, shit! He got her. So, um, and then he left. And as fate would have it, she survived that. Yeah, I was gonna say it didn't sound like he completed the job there. No, um, she left her house and ran a quarter mile to the neighbor to a neighbor's house. <laughs> Jesus, stabbed in the neck. Yeah, and she she pounded on the door, and the neighbors called 911. And later, she provided such good details to a sketch artist that they were able to identify him. And no she, kidding. Yeah, and so they put him in a lineup, and she picked him out of the lineup immediately. Wow. I think it was the same. It was the same night, like the that morning, early hours of the morning. They showed up to his house to arrest him. Like it was that quick and that yeah good. yeah. And she um. Because they had to be suspicious at that point. They had to be like, yeah, we you know. Yeah. They couldn't have been that clueless as to who it was. This dude's running around. Well, Crystal, I believe she um, she believed that everybody in the house had been killed, 
So she didn't even try to go to like the parents' room or she just took off down the street. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when they got there to arrest him, he opened the door. No resistance whatsoever. He said, I'm glad I, I'm glad I finally got caught. I was tired of doing this. They arrested him for murder. Wow. Yeah. Chris, so he, he didn't even try to deny it. No. He, he knew why they were there. And he was like, glad to see y'all. Glad, Guess it's my know. time. Yeah. Uh, Crystal Searles testified against him in open court. Like, talk about a badass little girl. You know what I mean? Seriously, what a badass. She, Let alone running quarter mile stabbed in the neck. You know oh, what I mean? Oh, and considering, like, after she after she got stabbed in the neck, I think she jumped down from the bunk and, like, held, like rubbed her friend's back and held her hand until she passed away. She sat there oh my God. trying to comfort her. And then she said after she heard her last breath, she knew she had died. She took off. Jesus. Yeah. and Hell she of a was, sleepover. Yeah, no shit. Uh, and she was only 20, 10 years old. You know what I mean? Kids, I mean, are, kids are fucking resilient, I man. I mean, at fucking 10 years old, Tommy was quitting school and smoking weed. And, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And she no tried kidding. to save her friend's life. And then she took off and ran to a quarter of a mile to save her own life. And then identified the guy. And then testified against him, and she was the one that helped put him away. What a badass. Yeah, and he was sentenced to death by lethal injection for those crimes. Good. Yeah, um, and I actually looked looked up some information on her. She's she's doing well now. Um, on Crystal. Crystal, correct. She's um, she's uh, in college now, I believe. Um, wow. Yeah, she's she's you can't you can't hardly even see. I saw pictures of her growing up. Basically, I looked at it like a timeline of her. Yeah. And you know you can see the scar on her neck. Where Th- this was in ninety nine. Now that it happened. Uh, ninety nine. Okay. Sorry, it's only written here in giant green numbers and letters. <laughs> uh, it was actually New Year's Eve of ninety nine. Jesus, fucking Christ, That's man! A nice welcome to the new year, right? Yeah. Um, For the millennium. <laughs> yeah. No shit. Like, <laughs> Everyone's freaking out about Y two K and shit. Which um, I'm still waiting on that yeah. whole fallout. Yeah, we'll like, see what fuck? happens. Right. Wow, so she's doing good. I want to talk about his execution because I find that oddly satisfying. Well, I mean, I'd find it more satisfying if he was beaten to death with a fucking hammer, but, you know. Of course. Take what well, you get, I don't I know. There's so many, and I think we should even do an episode on it um, about lethal injection, you know, because I've, 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 I've learned quite a bit about it. And uh, there's a lot of talk about it being extremely painful and that, you know, the second drug paralyzes your muscles. The third drug is potassium chloride, which stops your heart. But I hear it's like fire going in your veins. So it might just mask the ability to look like they're in pain and it might be absolute torture. Yeah, well, I just listened to a podcast that was dedicated completely to um, lethal injection. Uh Uh-huh. So that's been done. Um, (laughs) Well, so, (laughs) so I like talking about it. Um, well, he was uh, he was um, executed on April third of two thousand fourteen. Oh wow! Uh-huh. Uh huh. His sentence was carried out in the Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville. Yep. Um, he declined to make a final statement, and then they gave him the shot. He had the uh, the dose of what do they call it? Pen- pentobarbital. Pentol. Yeah. Whatever. So it's basically right. So or there's there's a few different ones I'm that not they a use. Scientist. There's a few different ones that they use, but basically it's Xanax that they put in you. It's uh, anytime you see Pram or Zam at the end of it, it's mm. it's it's uh, it's something very similar. So in in an average, if you go into the hospital and you if, you, if they give you something to calm down, um, like lorazepam or, or something Xanax, something like that, it's usually uh, a 0.5 milligrams. Um, so the like strong so the strongest dose that you'll take is a two milligram. Um, in the in the death chamber, it's 500 milligrams. Oh, well, that explains a lot because it says that uh, right after they gave him the shot, he took a couple of deep breaths, closed his eyes, and then began to snore. Sounds like he drifted off in a pretty nice way. Oh, uh, renders me. you unconscious for sure. Um, 13 minutes later, at 6.27 p.m., he was pronounced dead. Crystal Searles and members of both the Harris and the Perez family, Mary B's family, mm-hmm. uh, were at the execution. Interesting. Yeah, and I hope that it helped them in some way. Uh, yeah. You can't really take away that kind of pain, but... I hope that they some type of closure, some sort of satisfaction, because that's a hell of a thing, you know, to have somebody just feel like they have the authority and the right to just do what they want to your loved ones or to you. And yeah, so I hope that I hope they got something out of that. I wish he had gotten more out of that, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah, but at the same time, <clears throat> I mean, I've, I, I was watching one of the documentaries I was watching the other day. This dude was on death row, and it's basically torture for him because I think he's in Arizona or New Mexico and uh, they're about to kill him 
he's two days away in 48 hours you're going to be dead what's it like and he's like i'm just ready to get it over with and then uh as he's about to die it's a stay of execution we'll give you another day all right we'll give you another week and then he's about to die like like it's torture you know what i mean it's mental torture um there's a lot of things going on right now because the manufacturers of the drugs are no longer allowing the prisons to use them Hmm. um so (laughs) it's uh it's an interesting situation to say the least we'll talk about it more in maybe a different episode or some i don't know i think if you're gonna kill somebody for killing somebody he's trying that prisoner is trying to bring back the firing squad that's what he wants he wants to die by firing squad yeah i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of different methods out there and i think probably the uh the easiest way to go is probably lethal injection and i mean that's what they do to our fucking dogs that we love when when they get sick you know what i mean yeah basically yeah i I don't know. I I don't know. It's supposed I mean, to be a non cruel way. The one guy, this is one of the guys that worked, um, he wasn't the executioner, but he was a, a guard for the for the chamber. He said he would rather be electrocuted if it was him because you die a lot quicker. I don't know, man. That's what I've I seen was like, the Green oh, Mile. So I don't know, bro. Well, that's yeah, but that's a movie. You know what I mean? This dude, you know, he's don't like, forget to wet my sponge, man. If that ever happens, I know, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> But, um, you know, they were like, well, the death, the, the lethal injection process takes several minutes and, uh, you know, five minutes, ten minutes. There's horror stories of it taking an hour and being absolutely uh, horrible. Well, yeah, there's been there's been a lot of cases where it malfunctioned because yep. it's a machine that like it, you know, pulls it in. It's like an mm-hmm. IV, but yep. forced IV, I guess. And yeah. there's been times where two of the drugs administered and one of them didn't or it was not the right chemical or. Right. And. Or they didn't put the saline flush afterwards, which renders the drugs not as effective or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, things like that. Yeah, and I know people, all kinds of people have all different kinds of opinions on, um, you know, uh, the death penalty and capital punishment and things like that. But I don't think that there's a harsh enough punishment for raping and murdering a child. So they say the gas chamber is really bad. Yeah, I can imagine. So it would be like suffocating or drowning at uh, so they say it's exactly like suffocating. It's uh, basically you, you're strapped into a chair and into the into the chamber, which, I mean, if you haven't seen it, kind of looks like a round phone booth. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. and then there's vents in the floor. And they, they there's, a, there's, and there's I've seen different ones, but um, there's sometimes vents in the floor, and then sometimes there's a pellet dropped from the ceiling. Uh, and it's basically a cyanide mixture. Um, so it starts filling up with smoke, and the prisoners always hold their breath for as long as they can. And when they breathe it in, they'll start... Um, they start coughing. They start foaming at the mouth. Yeah, and cyanide a, ain't a joke. It's a pretty. If fucking, you know anything about Jim Jones and yeah, all that? Apparently, that's... it's a pretty, pretty bad way to go. Um, the, the the guy said that he would prefer to be electrocuted because the longest he's seen it take is forty five seconds. Hmm. I don't know. I don't be know about all that. Bad forty five seconds. I think I'm just gonna try to not get into fucking trouble if, if we're gonna be honest about it. I mean, like, I'd rather be shot in the head, man. But I'd rather just go on and live my life and die in my sleep. But, you know, you know? <laughs> it's different for everybody. Whatever floats your boat. Yeah, whatever blows your skirt up. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, I mean, that's that's that's, that's a lot to think about. I think we should uh, consider doing an episode on that. But, I mean, really, I think that's uh, kind of going to wrap it up for today. I know we're already I almost at an hour. I have a question for you, though. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Do you think you could ever be the one to enforce the death penalty? Oh, the man. I th- you know, the other night when I was doing, uh, I, got, I got kind of into a rabbit hole, a wormhole, and I, you know, watched like four documentaries and listened to people and watched videos of the chamber. And uh, there's different roles, you know what I mean? So the actual executioner is the one who pushes the drugs or pulls the lever or drops the pellet uh, or fires the weapon. And um, I don't know. You know, I don't know if I could. I, it's such a formal situation that I think it would freak me out. If it was in the heat of the moment, yeah, damn right. I would shoot somebody no problem. You know what I mean? I'm trained to do it, but I don't think that... I think that would freak me out. Just the fact that there's an audience and there's Just, a Yeah, it's time like so and, formal and there's like two waiting rooms and the curtains are pulled back and it's like super creepy. There's other people that are supposed to like watch your actions to make sure everything goes off without a hitch. And yeah, that's like another that. thing. What am I held liable for if something goes wrong? So it's not like a... Is it, it's not like a... Like a you're worried about your soul. You're wor- you're worried about like the actual. Well, I'm a ginger, so <laughs> touche, <taken>. touche. <laughs> yeah, I know I don't sound like one, but it's true. It is true. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's something I'd have to think about for sure. I have thought about. It. I just I don't know. I don't know if I could put myself in that situation. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near execution, honestly. You always hear about like uh, about these crimes against kids, or you know, and you mm-hmm. think. 
let me have five minutes in a room alone with him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's like, that's not like a formal execution. I, that's like, oh, it's so easy to be violent with somebody like that. I would definitely like fuck somebody up. You know what I mean? Especially if I caught someone in the act or something like that. But then right. like 26 years later and right. they're like an old man and you don't even know the crime and like, you know what I mean? Like you're not connected to the case at all. And, um, it's just super weird. Um, do I think I could do it? Yeah, I do. I think it would make me uncomfortable, though. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, like, sure. go to school for something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? While like, you're... And there's, like, medical I'm professionals just work, there. I'm just working my way through college. I'm like, these guys have got to be... I don't know, man. I don't know if they Going just... to school to be a doctor. Yeah. Fuck that. Funding it by killing people. Be a prison, be a prison doctor. Oh, God. I can't think of anything worse than that, you know? Yeah. Terrible, terrible, terrible Except stuff. Except for maybe being an inmate, but, you know. We <laughs> right. all have control over I can think that. of one worse thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess that's it then. Yeah, uh, so that's it for today. So I think that was a pretty, pretty strong McDuff. Yeah, is my guy, the broomstick killer. We got cells. I think and that was cells. a pretty. There's a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed our talk about it. Absolutely. And then um, let's. What's next week? What's number seven? God only knows. Yeah, I was gonna say only. You know, it's. It's a, it's all up in the air. <laughs> well, join us, Wex. Join us, Wex. Blah, blah, blah. Join us next week for episode seven. We're gonna dive into some more crazy uh, stuff. But until then, you'll want to hear it no matter what. Oh, so. of course, of course. And uh, check us out, of course, online at our website, thegravematter.com. We're gonna have our uh, our episodes posted up there as well as on um, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. Um, Please and, give us a review. Um, yeah, as long as it's good. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. It's like, yeah, just if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say nothing at all. No, but we appreciate you guys so so much. Thank you for uh, joining us, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Peace out. Bye.